Back to Philippians 3.18 from yesterday on the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whenever you say that phrase or you read it in Paul, in Philippians, you automatically think of worldly people. You think of really bad sinners. Uh, you think of murderers and adulterers and drunks and prostitutes. But this is not who we're talking about here. We're not talking about the world at large. Paul says in 3.18 of Philippians, many are walking, walking. That's an important word, walking. Also, many is an important word. Many are walking, of whom I often told you, yet now am lamenting also as I tell it. Paul's not going to be beside himself that the world doesn't believe in Jesus Christ or the cross. That's a given. But what is going to shock him, what, what is going, he's going to lament over and be mourning over is the fact that many are walking. And I remind you of the words of Jesus Christ. Many will be saying to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do wonderful works in your name? Cast out demons in your name. And I will say to them, depart from me, workers of lawlessness. It's the same situation here. Jesus was speaking of those who rejected the circumcision gospel. Paul is speaking of those who are rejecting the gospel of the uncircumcision. Jesus is speaking mainly, I guess, of Israelites. Uh, Paul is speaking mainly of those from the nations and the few in Israel who jump ship to become members of the body of Christ. But these are not members of the body of Christ, but they're walking among like sheep in, like wolves in sheep clothing. Paul says another important sentence. It's really shocking. You have to stop and think about it in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. He talks about the possibility of believing feignedly. Believing feignedly. Paul says, I submit to you the gospel that I received from Jesus Christ, in which also you believe, apart from which you believe feignedly. So it's possible to believe something, to look like you believe something, but you don't. Paul says, many are doing this. And that's certainly the case today when we are in the tail end of the apostasy. Many are walking, and I'm lamenting over this, Paul says, who are enemies of the cross. And as I told you yesterday, it bears repeating, they're not enemies of Christ, because they name Christ. They're not enemies of his sacrifice. They're not enemies that he died for our sins. They're enemies of the cross, the torture fest, the six hour gruesome and all the preceding hours of his arrest, his mocking before Herod, before Pilate, his scourging at the hands of the Romans, the humiliation, slapping his face, the crown of thorns, the mock veneration, all that stuff is wildly uncalled for. It's wildly, uh, even in the details, unpredicted in the scriptures. I don't say his suffering and his death isn't predicted. I say the details of the Roman method of death and the particular sufferings and humiliations that Christ underwent. Something more is happening here. And it's then, then a sacrifice for the sins of Israel, even for the sins of the world. It's something even more. And that's the death of the old humanity. He is taking Adam up by the roots and demolishing it. And now he's bringing us a new humanity. We are to think of ourselves as having been identified with Christ in his death, in his entombment, and in his resurrection, in his crucifixion, not just his death. That No. Let me retract that, because that's what I'm going against here. His crucifixion. Cross and crucifixion go hand in hand. Cross and crucifixion. This is what people stumble at. This is the snare that I mentioned earlier this week. This is what creates enemies. But they, they, they don't wake up in the morning and say, we're going to be enemies of the cross. Christians don't do that. But by nature, by uh, of the fact that they're still wrestling with the old humanity, they're digging up the corpse, they're propping up the corpse, and they're trying to reform it. They're trying to take a dead body and paint a smile on it and fix its ears and comb its hair. This is a complete 
tacit admission that you are not acquainted with the new humanity and you are not acquainted with the cross of Christ because it eliminates the old humanity. Uh, I think of 2 Timothy chapter 3 too going along with this. Um, Paul talks about having a form of devoutness yet denying the power. And that's on a long list of attributes that will exist at the end of this eon, at the end of millennium six. And you know, men will be humans, not just men, humans will be lovers of selves, haters of parents, ostentatious, proud. And he ends that list with um, having a form of devoutness, yet denying the power. And that's the most disgusting thing to him. And this is what we see, the people have a form of devoutness, talking about the cross, but they're actual enemies of it. Even while they're smiling, even while they're in church, even while they're singing hymns, they're enemies of the death. Because again, they're still fighting with their sin. That's the first, that's the first sign. The new creation is an astounding thing. Now I'm going to read from, hopefully I'll be able to get to the two types of unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is the practical result of having been crucified with Christ, been entombed with him, and we shall be of the resurrection also. But anticipating that, we have a message now anticipating our resurrection with Christ. Something you can believe now, and it's called the new creation. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 i've read this to you many times but the love of christ is constraining us judging this that if one died for the sake of all consequently all died and he died for the sake of all that those who are living should by no means still be living to themselves by no means still be living to yourself it doesn't mean it's not necessarily saying that you you you, you have to stop being selfish stop being arrogant stop your whatever irritating things you do that you don't like about yourself he's just saying that you stop living to yourself period here's the key this will help you better understand that verse 16 so that we from now on are acquainted with not one according to flesh we're not acquainted with anyone anymore according to flesh not even ourselves we're not acquainted with ourselves that way we see ourselves as a new creation doesn't mean we are one yet otherwise we wouldn't have to reckon it as being so Paul says reckon yourselves to have died with Christ you can only it's only necessary to reckon it if it hasn't happened otherwise we wouldn't need to reckon it we would be living it yet even if we have known christ according to flesh nevertheless we know him so no longer verse 17 so that if anyone is in christ there is a new creation the primitive passed by lo there has come new and this is why we can relax this is why we don't have to fret over our sins and this is why Remember my wife's cousin, Marge, Marge, I can mention her name because she doesn't watch this show. She doesn't read any of my articles. I don't think if she does, hi, Marge, I'm going to talk about you a little bit. Marge used to be very disappointed in me because I'm kind of like a loose cannon and I, I say things, I, I use humor, humor and humor sometimes when I feel like it, I, it'd be a crazy day for me to use humor, humor, but I, I will do it if the need is called for. But ordinarily it's humor and um i'd like i i'm probably i'm kind of the donald trump of evangelism okay let's just put it that way and so um i'm ragged i'm rough around the edges and she would constantly criticize me for that and i would always say to her marge you're camped on the wrong side of the cross you're still wrestling with the old humanity or at least with my old humanity and i've i'm i'm past that it's like i'm done fooling with it and now i'm free to be myself and what i wanted to ask her was how many people have you introduced to the gospel of the grace of god but i didn't but i could have it's a legitimate question actually because I, I, I find that when we're free and when we're not under the constraints of the old humanity that is dressing up the corpse, then the, the truth can flow much more honestly, much, much more openly without filters. 
uh, without second guessing yourself, as I said yesterday, and that's what most people are uncomfortable with. And that's why you see, this is why the pastors on TV, they're very careful. They have to be very careful. They have to be very politically correct and spiritually correct because they're on television before millions of people. I could possibly be talking to millions of people here on this video, but it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me if I talk to one or a million. It doesn't matter to me because I have given up on the old humanity. I've given up on it. I no longer worry about it or fret with it. How can you do that, Martin? You're still in flesh. I know, but this is a truth that's given to us in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 goes along with Romans chapter 6. The antithesis of it is are the enemies of the cross, and you can s spot them a mile away. They're psychoanalyzing you. They're putting you under a microscope. They are becoming the moral authorities in your life, telling you how to live. You're not living the right Christian life, and you're rolling your eyes. You, I can't even, speaking for myself, um, I can't even, I don't even think that way. I haven't thought that way in so long because I've so given up and I've so embraced this newness and I'm so not looking in the mirror, either front wise or the rear view mirror, that the life of God and the life of Christ can flow out of me unfiltered. I can be spiritually incorrect. And in the process of doing that, many people are blessed. It's it's a crazy thing, but it's just the truth. That's what's happening. That's what has happened. So now let's go. We have time to do this. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 21. There are two different kinds of unbelievers in the world. You've heard me teach this before, probably, but it's on my heart to teach it today. There are worldly unbelievers and there are religious unbelievers, but they have one thing in common. It's the common word there, unbelievers. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21, God delights through the stupidity of the heralding. And we're going to be talking about the cross here again. God delights through the stupidity of the heralding to save those who are believing. And again, we discussed where belief comes from. It's a gift. It's humanly impossible to believe in God. Humanly impossible. Since, in fact, Jews, signs are requesting. This is the religious people. Paul is using Jews and Greeks here as representatives. The Jews are representing the religious contingent, and the Greeks are representing the rest of the world, the nations. And the Jews and the Greeks have two different problems that keep them from believing in Christ. The Jews are looking for a sign. Again, just like Paul says in Philippians 3, to the terrestrial, they are disposed. Oh, I got to tell you this. Remember that crazy uh, word in there, the bowels? Their, their, their God is their bowels. Philippians 3, 18. That's one of the marks, one of the signs of a someone who is an enemy of the cross of Christ. Their glory is in their shame, and their God is their bowels. It's like, what's his bowels? It's, it's the compassion. It's the passion. It's the enthusiasm. Free will is your bow. That's the bow. The bowels. Free will. The human mm, to accomplish, to feel good about something you do. The inner man that longs to express itself. You might as well say that's the definition. I'll just say that's the definition of human free will. Their God is human free will. That's their God. Their God is human free will. They can't imagine that salvation truly is of grace and that humanity comes from one lump of clay. Can't wrap their heads around it. And it's human pride that keeps them from doing that. It's the pride of the flesh. It's being to the, disposed to the terrestrial. And many are walking whose God is their bowels. It doesn't mean they eat a lot of food. It doesn't mean they go to the bathroom a lot. It doesn't mean they love to spend time in the toilet. That's not what that means. It means their God is their passion for Christ. And they have such a passion for Christ that they chose Jesus above all other people. Nobody else had the smarts, the wisdom, the know-how, the common sense. Just, just believe in Jesus. They did it. They did it. That's their God. 
Jesus Christ is a savior in name only. For the enemies of the cross of Christ, the standard, the pole, the torture stake, for the enemies of that stake, salvation by Christ is in name only. Jesus is their God in name only. Their real, real God is their own gut, their gut feeling, their gut instinct to go with Christ. I went with Christ. I got her done. I went to the altar. I said the sinner's prayer. I pray 10 times a day. I fast during Lent. I go to church every Sunday. What are you talking about? All of that. Let's just say any good act. I'm not calling going to church a good act. I'm just saying any good thing you do comes after the new creation, comes after the death of Christ. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Did you know that Jesus Christ never saved a believer? No. Jesus Christ never saved one believer. Paul says, I believe it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, around verse 16, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, not believers, sinners. How do you save sinners? Because don't you at least have to stop sinning long enough to believe in Jesus? That's the Christian lie. The people who tell you that are enemies. And I know some really sweet, beautiful, loving people, people who are beloved by me, who are enemies of the cross of Christ. That's why Paul lamented. He's not going to be crying his eyes out over some worldly guy who's out some 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 barabbas type guy who's out murdering people well that guy's an enemy of the cross i can't believe it he's not gonna bring him to tears he's not gonna be shocked he's not gonna be writing it down in the scriptures that's duh of course but what makes him cry and what shocks him and what he is loathe to even write down and tell the corinthians is that many are walking many are in the circle of those who call themselves Believers who are enemies of the cross, enemies of the death of the old creation. And again, you can spot them a mile away because they're still wrestling with their own flesh and they're still trying to micromanage yours. I pray for all those people. I pray for Marge that she can somehow see the wisdom of God in what I'm doing. She might not see it in this life. She might not see the wisdom of God in this presentation or any of my writing, any of my work, any of my little jokes, any of my song and dance. I'm not worried about it. I lament. I guess that's different than worrying. I didn't get through what I needed to tell you about the two different kinds of unbelievers. We got started on that. It's worldly unbelievers. That's no shock. It's no shock that there are worldly unbelievers. We all know that. The shock and the lament is that there are religious unbelievers. And we're surrounded by them.